Nuclear technology doesn't get great publicity. In blockbuster films, it creates terrifying monsters such as Godzilla and the Hulk. It's characterized by incompetence in cult TV shows like The Simpsons We're doomed! and the hit HBO series Chernobyl. What did you do? I, I did what you said, I switched. Look at it! And it's normally in the news because something has gone wrong. It's an atomic fire and the Soviets can't contain it. A third explosion at the Fukushima power plant. Japanese Prime Minister says radioactive levels around the plant are high. But nuclear energy is safe reasonably reliable and efficient. Without it, it'll be much harder to fight climate change. So why does nuclear power still only make up 10% of global electricity generation? The natural power of the universe is harnessed in the new atomic bomb. Its tremendous possibilities are explained. In 1945, nuclear's full, unimaginable power was demonstrated to the world. Eight years later, President Eisenhower proposed using nuclear energy as a way to redeem humankind for having brought such an awful technology into existence. The United States knows that peaceful power from atomic energy is no dream of the future. That capability already proved is here. Now, today. When the nuclear reactors first um, open, there's a, there's a big futuristic buzz about them. This is when jet planes are new, nuclear reactors are new. We're short, just short of the age of the satellite. So this is very much a symbol of modernity. And it's also a symbol in some eyes of peace. In 1956, the world's first commercial nuclear power station was opened in Britain. By the end of the 1960s, 78 reactors had been built across 14 countries. Nuclear reactors generate power through nuclear fission, a process where uranium atoms are split and release energy. In the center of an atom is its nucleus, which contains protons and neutrons. In the process of nuclear fission, one of these nuclei breaks apart, producing smaller nuclei, some neutrons and some energy. If one of the neutrons hits another nucleus, it too will break apart in what is known as a chain reaction. To ensure the chain reaction takes place at the right speed and the power plant doesn't overheat, control rods made of neutron absorbing materials are lowered into the reactor. In most reactors, they sit in water, which acts as a moderator, slowing down the neutrons and helping control the rate of the reaction. The energy from the chain reaction produces a huge amount of heat, which most reactors use to turn water into steam. Nuclear power plants are basically very large kettles. They take water and they heat it up a lot, and then the heated water, the steam, can drive turbines. And that's kind of what a coal power plant or a gas power plant does too. But nuclear does it very efficiently and it does it with far less fuel because uranium has an awful lot of energy in it, whereas coal and gas have comparatively little. So you can fuel a, a, a nuclear reactor with you know tons of fuel rather than thousands of tons of fuel. Um, it's, it's like an invisible force, isn't it? What happens if there is an accident? We've got... We've got no chance. And if it's uncontrollable, it's going to cause some harm, isn't it? So what damaged nuclear power's reputation? To understand, we need to go back to where we left off in the nuclear boom of the 1960s. Initially, some environmentalists were supporters of nuclear energy. They saw it as an alternative to flooding valleys for hydroelectric power. But then they changed their minds. Fallout warning, Canterbury 1, Canterbury 2, Canterbury... In the 1960s, some people begin to worry that nuclear power stations, just in their everyday running, will poison the world. This is not remotely true, but it becomes part of a campaign. 
But the big worry comes, um, I think, in the early 1970s when people start worrying that a nuclear accident is in some ways like an atomic bomb going off. And you've got to remember there's a, there's a lot of other pessimism going around in the early 70s. People are having a crisis of um, trust in authority. There's a general feeling of paranoia and nothing nothing speaks to feelings of paranoia like radiation. Because radiation is invisible and it could be all around you and you'll never know. The result was a backlash against nuclear further fueled by the release in 1979 of a film called The China Syndrome, which vividly portrays an accident at a nuclear power station. The thing about The China Syndrome, other than its pretty good sort of like example of that sort of like 1970s paranoid filmmaking, is that it comes out more or less at exactly the same time as there is a nuclear accident at Three Mile Island. The two water pumps that help cool reactor number two shut down. Officials say some 50 to 60,000 gallons of radioactive water escaped into the reactor building. This was followed by the infamous meltdown at Chernobyl in 1986. And then in 2011, a tsunami led to an accident at a nuclear power station in Fukushima, Japan. Each accident stoked fears about nuclear power. After Fukushima, Nuclear had the lowest global public support of all energy sources, even lower than coal. But nuclear power is one of the safest forms of energy production. Although the official death toll linked to Fukushima stands at almost 600, all of these fatalities, bar one, were attributed to the stress of the evacuation. We had a full-scale meltdown at Fukushima and that didn't kill people. I caused a huge bill for cleaning up, but it didn't kill people. So in normal operation, and these days, even when breaking down, a well-regulated nuclear power plant is not a dangerous object. Compared to other forms of energy production, the death rate from nuclear energy is very low. On average, it kills one person every 14 years. In fact, in 2013, climatologists James Hansen and Pushka Karecha calculated that the use of nuclear power between 1971 and 2009 prevented the deaths of 1.84 million people thanks to its air pollution benefits. The fear that nuclear plants emit dangerous levels of radiation is overblown. The only accident which released high levels of radiation and caused significant harm to public health was Chernobyl. But it was a not very good nuclear plant being run in a terrible way. People worry about radiation, but in general, nuclear power stations do not release radiation. A more substantial concern centers on nuclear fuel. Nuclear power stations need nuclear fuel, and normally that nuclear fuel has to be something that's been enriched. Now that enrichment process is also the process that you use to make nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons can also be made by extracting plutonium from spent nuclear fuel. This means countries can use power stations as a cover-up for developing weaponry, risking the spread of atomic weapons to nations not recognized as nuclear weapon states in the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Most people with nuclear power stations are not proliferation risks. They either have nuclear weapons um, or clearly don't really want nuclear weapons. What you worry about is when you have a country that, you're, that is in an unstable part of the world and starts getting interested in nuclear technology. Perhaps the most worrying example is Iran. Since the 1980s, Western governments have been concerned that Iran will use its uranium enrichment program for military purposes. To Tehran, this is a peaceful civilian enterprise, but some around the world fear it may lead to the development of a nuclear weapon. But developing nuclear weapons from civilian programs is difficult. Reactors only need uranium enriched to about 
nuclear weapons can need levels of around 90%. And while extracting plutonium is slightly easier, any country planning to launch a new nuclear power industry will attract close attention from bodies like the International Atomic Energy Agency. But ultimately, the reason nuclear power is not used more widely stems from one crucial factor. It's really expensive. Nuclear power stations are very large, fairly complex um, systems, which you have to build very precisely. They're huge construction projects which drag out over time and that drives up the cost. For nuclear reactors completed between 2016 and 2019, the median construction time was almost 17 years. The cost can be kept to some extent contained if you make a lot of something. And that's, to some extent, the secret of the success of the French programme. The French chose a specific design and made a lot of it. The Chinese are doing something similar. In America, there was never any standardisation. That's one of the reasons why the cost got completely out of control in the 1970s. And that helps explain why the number of active reactors around the world has hardly changed since the 1980s. And a quarter of existing nuclear reactors in advanced economies are expected to close by 2025. Nuclear power has also become a less attractive option as renewables such as solar and wind have fallen in cost. But tackling climate change with just renewables is much more challenging. It is a lot easier to decarbonise an electricity system if you have uh, a certain amount of what's often called firm generating capacity that you can rely on to be there. And nuclear supporters will tell you that nuclear is a very good example of that. Some advocates of nuclear power also hope that a new approach called advanced nuclear technology could address the high cost of nuclear energy. This involves smaller reactors which can be built off-site, making them much cheaper and quicker to construct. It would be a big investment to actually build an experiment and I'm not sure that it's the most timely thing. I think that you know, nuclear power plants that are currently quite new will probably keep running a lot longer than I will. But the idea that we can have what used to be called, basically until Fukushima, a nuclear renaissance, that nuclear renaissance hasn't happened. Without a dramatic reduction in costs, it's unlikely nuclear will ever reach the same heady heights of the 1960s boom. Perhaps if the environmentalists then had known how powerful a threat climate change would become, the outcome for nuclear might have been very different. I'm Oliver Morton, Briefings Editor at The Economist. To read our report on the lessons of Fukushima, please click on the link opposite. And if you've enjoyed this, please subscribe to our channel for more.